Thanks very much, Gina. And um, welcome back, everybody. I, I see some people are still sort of uh, slowly straggling back. I hope you've had a good morning. The feedback that I have heard has been extremely positive, um, which, is, which is great. Uh, but of course, it's not over. Uh, so it's a pleasure uh, to welcome uh, to the, uh, uh, the lectern, podium, or whatever it's called, uh, my colleague on the Governing Council, the Governor of the Banque de France, Francois Villeroy de Gaulle. So, dear Gabriel, liebe Verena, cher Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Gabriel, yes, we are colleagues. We are perhaps a bit more than colleagues. We are friends. And thank you for inviting me in Dublin today. I'm delighted to be in Aviva Stadium. I belong to a country which also has a strong rugby team, as you are aware. And I am old enough to have heard about the old name of Lanstone Road. Here I am. And I can only wish, sorry to do it in Ireland, but that the French rugby team will, in the next game, it's in February or something like them, have the same kind of success as in recent past. But you didn't invite me to speak about rugby, uh, but about financial stability. Uh, and let me start with the obvious. Uh, as a result of the unprecedented, really unprecedented succession of shocks and crises we are living through, financial stability is returning to the front stage. Against this backdrop, I will reflect first on the possible end of what we could call the golden decade for financial regulation and financial stability. And second, I will focus on the real estate sector, so sensitive here in Ireland, but also in my country, as a practical study case of our macroprudential toolkit. Let me start with the favorable decade we have experienced since the great financial crisis. It has now been 15 years since its onset. No need to recall, especially here, the social, economic, and financial damage incurred. But lessons were learned. A favorable era for financial regulation followed, and this resulted in several achievements to strengthen the regulatory framework, first and foremost for financial institutions, but also in bringing unregulated segments, activities, and actors under supervisory watch, such as over-the-counter markets and somewhat, somewhat rating agencies or hedge funds. Even though there still remains room for improvement, notably for a better regulation of non-bank financial intermediations, Gabriel, I understand you raised a point already this morning. I will, I will come back to it. I will not be long, but to put it in a nutshell, in the banking sector, improvements are more than evident. The Basel III agreements, finalized in 2017, require larger and sounder buffers and strengthened market discipline. In Europe, as you know well, the great financial crisis was closely followed by a public debt crisis resulting from the sovereign bank nexus. As a response, the EU area has forged the banking union. Overall, the European banking sector has, without any doubt, become more resilient. Requirements have also been increased in the insurance sector, thanks to solvency, solvency II since 2016, which is currently under revision. We also deal, as Europeans, uh, after the mid-2010s, 
with two structural transformations, ecological and digital. First, Europe has developed a consistent corpus of regulation on extra financial disclosure, taxonomy, SFDR, CSDR, etc. And we also uh, adopted early regulations on the digital side with a couple of very important texts, DORA for the operational risks uh, and increasing IT security requirements for the entire financial sector and MICA for crypto assets and the regulation of crypto asset service providers. I wish other major jurisdictions will follow suit on these two issues, especially crypto assets. Yet, yet, I hear repeatedly from the banking sector that prudential regulation is now excessive. Let me explain why these claims seem unfounded. In the past 10 years, the regulatory framework has not hindered the sound financing of our economies. Let me give the French example. Bank loans outstandings have increased by 57% since 2010. This is almost three times faster than the growth of our economy measured by nominal GDP. As time passes, we must be careful not to succumb to what I would call the temptation to forget. This very specific phenomenon has a nickname in economic theory. It is called disaster myopia. In order to prevent this today, we must absolutely implement the Basel III Accord. I had the privilege of chairing the so-called GEOS group of governors and heads of supervision up to the start of this year. I would like to reiterate here its call for a full and consistent implementation by all jurisdictions, including, by the way, I say it here in Dublin, the United Kingdom, where regulators rightly argue against the temptation of a race to the bottom. All jurisdictions must effectively implement this Basel III till 1st of January 2025, just over two years from now. This is about what we did on regulation. But what did it mean for financial stability? Because financial regulation is not an end in itself. It is only a means to achieve the overarching goal of financial stability. This regulation has proven quite effective so far. We have successfully overcome the demanding stress tests of the COVID crisis. Capital requirements have considerably bolstered the resilience of the banking sector. I come here to my first slide, and this is a French example, but the figures would not be very different in other European countries. The core equity tier one ratio of the six main French banks increased continuously from 5.8% in 2008 to 15.7% in 2021. These times, in the COVID crisis and in the present Ukraine crisis, banks have shifted from being part of the problem to part of the solution. They provided the vital liquidity shield needed by businesses during the acute phase of the crisis. Unfortunately, financial stability is not a steady state that can be reached once and for all. It is a permanent task that requires constant awareness. And today, we are indeed facing growing concerns. We have entered a new phase of extremely rapid asset repricing and high volatility on financial markets. The Russian war in Ukraine 
cast a shadow of uncertainty and significant uncertainty over the economic outlook, where aggravating tensions on energy and commodity markets, you are very familiar with these curves, uh, cause the resurgence of inflation. This is motivating us, central banks around the world, to normalize monetary policy. By the way, I won't say any word in my speech about monetary policy, uh, but I can only see that as a result, financial conditions have tightened and could tighten further. What is the bottom line against this background? Quite simple, yes, we are facing rising threats to financial stability. But being gloomy and excessively alarmist across the board may prove to be inaccurate and even counterproductive and result in some self-fulfilling financial distress. Our prime role as guardian of financial stability is to remain objective, vigilant, and to differentiate the various situations. Let me mention three differentiations. First, although we did the job for banks and insurers, we didn't do it for non-banks and other non-bank financial intermediation, NBFI. Look, what is there in common in the last three financial instability episodes we have lived through? The dash for cash of many funds, starting with MMF in March 2020, the tensions on the commodity markets and derivatives this year, and pension funds' use of derivatives in the UK, resulting in fire sales of gold, of gilts. Clearly, the common feature is liquidity management and insufficient liquidity regulation of non-banks. Tackling this systemic risk will require the development of additional rules in the FSB framework, both for leverage and for liquidity management. Strict liquidity requirements would contribute to prevent ex ante moral hazard and thus avoid ex post central banks' interventions. Second topic of concern. Interest rates are going up at a time when the level of public and private debt are at historic highs in many countries. Especially if you look at the right part of the panel, uh, public debt at 97% of GDP at end 2020 versus less than 80% in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. Nominal debt levels, and this is the left part, have increased by a total of almost 90 trillion, trillion dollars for all FSB member jurisdictions since the JFC. However, with debt maturity profile spread out over time and much of the borrowing at fixed rate, these vulnerabilities remain contained. May I come to a third necessary differentiation is that each country stands at a different place. If I take the example of the French financial sector, both banks and insurance have proven quite resilient with strong capital and liquidity positions. In terms of profitability, orderly rising interest rates should also have a progressive and positive effect on banks' net interest margins. All of these factors explain, as you can see this on this chart, CDS premiums on French banks have remained lower so far, on average, than that of the US, the UK, and the rest of Europe. Let me add one thing about the parallel with the guilt crisis. We happen in France not to have pension funds. It's not always an advantage 
but in this regard, at least, it is wrong. And French insurance companies don't make significant use of the same kind of derivatives that would imply margin calls. These three thoughts about financial stability bring me to a more general remark about macroprudential policy in the present and new context of tightening monetary policy. When rates were low, macroprudential policy was essential to contain financial risk, allowing monetary policy to remain loose as long as necessary. But now, how to revise our macroprudential stance? If we release, we may contribute to the inflation dynamics through the usual credit channel. If we tighten on the opposite, we can contribute to triggering financial risks. Prudence could be of the essence, and this could be the time for some macroprudential pause. I come to my second part, which is a practical case study in the real estate sector. May I first precise that in France, our macroprudential body is the so-called High Council for Financial Stability, Au Conseil de Stabilité Financière in French, HCSF. Uh, you will be interested by the institutional arrangements because this is a question all of us share. This HCSF is shared by the finance minister, but I, as governor, have the sole power to propose macroprudential measures to the council. It's a subtle institutional balance, but it works. In recent years, we have used actively the counter-cyclical capital buffer removing it in March 2020 to zero, reintroducing it in April this year at 0.5%, and planning to raise it at 1% next December. And you might be also interested to note that the CCYB is always very difficult to explain to public opinion. The words are complex, and the purpose is a bit sophisticated. So we decided to rebrand it, at least in our communication, Credit Protection Scheme, which is probably more telling. Let me come to the practical case on a sector that has often proved critical to financial stability, the real estate sector. It's politically more sensitive for citizens Still more in this country, severe financial crises have often related to housing boom and bust cycles. The great financial crisis was a stark example thereof. So, to be a bit more precise about my practical study case, three years ago, in December 2019, this HCSF issued a recommendation to strengthen banks' lending criteria when granting housing loans through ceilings. These were borrower-based measures. Ceilings both for the debt service to income ratio and the initial maturity, which are today set at 35% for the debt service to income ratio and 20 years for the maturity with a certain flexibility margin to be granted primarily to purchasers of principal residences and first-time buyers. Then, a bit less than two years later, we transform it in September 21 in a legally binding standard and provided the ACPR, the supervisory body, the possibility of imposing significant sanctions. I should underline, and probably Gabrielle and many others in the room, you will have shared the same experience. I should underline that the implementation of this recommendation was no walk in the park. We had, I had, to confront strong criticism. First, of strangling, I quote, the housing sector and mortgages production. 
Well, we explained, we adjusted, we resisted, and here we are. It is now well embedded in market practices. The share, as you can see on the slide, of non-compliant housing loans has significantly decreased and is now well below the 20% flexibility margin. Credit growth has started to decelerate orderly 6.2% last September compared to 6.6% one year ago, but it's still dynamic. Our aim, we said it from the start, was not to make credit scarce, but ensure that it was sound. In taking these decisions, our HCSF usefully adapted the measures already invoked in other European countries and took their efficiency as a benchmark. Ireland was obviously a source of inspiration as, among others, an early adopter of borrower-based measures. The tightening of our macroprudential stance has indeed strengthened household resilience. However, the housing sector has proved particularly dynamic following the COVID crisis. And you can see on this last slide some figures. Annual house price growth in the euro area reacted, reached almost plus 10% in the beginning of 22 following a little over 4% on average between 2016 and 2019. Should we then worry about an increased possibility of a financial turn? At this stage, risk of an abrupt turn in the cycle, with consequences similar to those observed in 20 or 7 or 8, appear limited in France. To give just a few reasons, in, additional, in addition to macroprudential measures, over 97% of the stock of housing loans are fixed rates. Borrower solvency is assessed in a very cautious way. Real estate is not used as collateral for credit, as they are in several Anglo-Saxon countries meaning that real estate price adjustments do not result in an increased repayment burden. We nevertheless have to remain very vigilant, including in other segments of the real estate market. In particular, commercial real estate, even if with less significant amounts, comes to mind it has been slowing around the world because of the greater recourse to remote work and online business and because of rising interest rates. Let me come to my conclusion and mention this year's Economic Nobel Prize awarded, as you know, to Ben Bernanke and to Diamond and Dibvig for, I quote, research on banks and financial crisis. The diamond Dibvig model especially reminds us that what makes banks useful is also precisely what makes them vulnerable. The sustainability of this precarious equilibrium relies on one key condition, trust. And here, let me draw a parallel with the words of another Nobel Prize, but not in economics, and an Irish man, one of the most famous Irish dramatists, Samuel Beckett, who also, by the way, lived in Paris. I quote him, the creation of the world did not take place once and for all time, but takes place every day. I find it a nice sentence. And I think that this also applies to trust and financial stability. We supervisors, be assured, will remain vigilant every day in safeguarding a safe and efficient financial system. 
and we can benefit from macroprudential work done in fellow member states. In this regard, both Ireland and France provide instructive and encouraging examples. Thank you for your attention.